Hello, everybody. Um, I hope everyone's enjoying the conference so far. I thought that the panels this morning were absolutely fantastic. And it's such a refreshing change to be talking about cannabis in the context of botanical medicine and not trying to defend ourselves as, you know, drug peddling people. It's, it's wonderful. It's a big change. I mean, it really is a very, very different way of talking about this. And so this uh, talk, this panel is going to be on models of regulation. And again, we're moving past this if and we're moving into the when. We're moving into we need to know how to do this now. This isn't all about, you know, trying to get legitimacy for medical cannabis. It's about figuring out how to actually implement these programs and make them workable. And, you know, outside of the United States and Canada, there are a lot of other countries that have taken amazing steps in medical cannabis regulation. Um, of course, Israel comes to mind um, as a fantastic program that not only recognizes the benefits of cannabis for their population, but the benefits of not only whole plant medicine, but doing research on the whole plant medicine to better serve the needs of their communities. Um, we have countries like the Netherlands that rely on a different regulatory model. They contract with one company, Bedrican, to produce medical grade cannabis for the whole country's regulatory program. And then finally, we have Uruguay. Uruguay, who's come on the scene as being the first country to fully legalize marijuana. And I'm very excited to say that uh, Mr. Philippe Lucas and I will be traveling to Uruguay tomorrow to participate, right? Uh, to participate in a medical cannabis conference that's being sponsored by the government, looking specifically at the medical implications and uses for cannabis. Now, I just realized I didn't introduce myself. I kind of assume you all know who I am. Um, I'm Amanda Ryman, and I'm the California Policy Manager for the Drug Policy Alliance. So, hi. Um, <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, so this panel today is really going to talk about what are our options, not only in terms of overall regulation, but really getting into the nuances. I mean, this is where the work really starts. Like, we thought the work was in getting people to accept medical cannabis and getting laws passed in states around medical cannabis. Now, don't get me wrong, that's a lot of work, and we're still working on that. But then we have to figure out, okay, we've got the law. Now, how do we make it work? What does this mean for cultivation? And what does this mean for labor? And what does this mean for all the parties and constituencies that are now going to be a part of this industry? How do we make sure that moving forward, we are doing so in an environmentally responsible way, in a socially responsible way? And I think that the cannabis industry could actually be a model for how to do it right. I think that we could have regulations that really bolster environmental protections, that really ensure that the individuals that are working in this industry, from the cultivator to the packager to the person dispensing the cannabis, are getting wonderful wages with full benefits and full protections, we have an opportunity to be a shining star of regulation. And I know that regulation can be a dirty word, but I think we can turn that around. And I think we can show how regulation can really protect those that are trying to make this industry everything it can be. So in the interest of time, we have fabulous speakers today. Um, I'm going to let them introduce themselves rather than read their bios from the program, which you can read yourself. Um, and we're going to jump right into it. Um, so I really hope you enjoy this panel. And uh, Mike, you're up. Thanks, Amanda. Uh, my name is Mike Lazuski. I am the policy director here at Americans for Safe Access, so my job consists uh, a lot on giving our uh, legislative analysis and our regulatory analysis. Uh, so I you know, see regulations, uh, the draft versions, the final versions from all over the country, and help put together our comments on those. And there's some, you know, some exciting trends that are happening right now. You know, there's, you can really look at the evolution of. Uh, medical cannabis laws and regulations in this country sort of in three uh, phases. The first phase was just not getting arrested. You know, the laws that just make it so that patients will not get arrested, that there's a legal uh, right to use this medicine. And that was sort of, you know, the first wave in Alaska and Hawaii, you know, are still actually on that level. Uh, but many more states have sort of moved into the next phase, which is having a legal place to obtain your medicine, like a dispensary. And there's you know, a great many states, growing number, uh, Oregon and Nevada, you know, long-time medical cannabis states just recently added uh, dispensaries to their, um, uh, their programs, and they're working on the implementation of those regulations right now. Um, 
And then we have this third phase, and this is sort of the really exciting one in terms of uh, you know, making this uh, you know, really more of a legitimate uh, wellness uh, option, and that's product safety. We're moving into the product safety phase of regulation, uh, and we're seeing better rules and uh, more um, complex, sophisticated rules uh, dealing with that. Um, just going back, though, to uh, the area of how to purchase, uh, where we purchase medicine at dispensaries, the regulations on those level. Um, at some point, at some times, uh, these regulation uh, discussions, uh, they get focused more on the business specifics, and these are important issues, uh, but the focus occasionally can get away from how does this serve patients. And when you're commenting on regulations, when you're looking at this, uh, having these discussions with regulatory bodies, uh, and with the, the potential um, uh, providers, the potential dispensaries, the potential cultivators, it's really important to keep the focus on how does this serve patients? How are patients going to be able to, to obtain medicine? How is the medicine going to be affordable? Um, one great thing that we've been seeing with uh, dispensaries in terms of studying them and how they interact in the community is they actually are really good assets to the community. Uh, every study that has come out so far examining uh, community safety with respect to medical cannabis laws and dispensaries, no evidence that they're associated with an increase in crime uh, or any other uh, deleterious uh, community effects. And in fact, if anything, there's some evidence that says they uh, may increase uh, public safety. There's no hard evidence on that, and it's you know, to a minor extent, but it, what it really says is that dispensaries are good neighbors. And that, you know, th this information is out there. Uh, the University of Houston, or University of Texas, rather, uh, just came out with a new report on medical cannabis laws uh, and their impact. And it's, I think, you know, regulators need to see this so that they know that these are good, uh, good neighbors and good uh, f uh, assets to the community. Um, but we're seeing more and more product safety uh, regulations coming into medical cannabis uh, programs, and this is really a great thing. Uh, several years ago, we just started to see how uh, product testing would be coming into uh, medical cannabis uh, laws, and it was asking dispensaries when they were applying or cultivation sites when they were applying to be uh, part of a state program to list testing as part of their application. How will they test the medicine? And this was sort of like one of the first ways that this has reached into uh, medical cannabis programs. Uh, but now we're starting to see uh, a, a move towards independent testing, independent testing labs, and more sophisticated testing requirements. Uh, the American Herbal Products Association guidelines on uh, dispensary operation uh, you know, speaks to this. And uh, the Massachusetts regulations that came out in 2013, there's about three and a half or four pages of very, very specific uh, testing regulations on how the medicine is to be tested um, and how it, you know, just very, very specific, very uh, practical approach on how we can get the best products to patients. Um, we're seeing more and more of this uh, across the country. Nevada is doing this. Colorado is, uh, has moved towards this with their testing. Um, and so generally across the country, we're just seeing more and more independent testing, and this is going to lead to better quality of medicine for patients uh, to obtain, and ultimately this is all, all good for everyone. Uh, another thing that we're starting to see more in uh, medical cannabis uh, regulations are training requirements. And this is another good feature for patients. We want to have highly trained staff uh, who are familiar with the rules, familiar with the regulations, and also familiar with how to uh, serve medical cannabis patients. Medical cannabis patients have some very specific and nuanced needs, and this sort of training can help uh, provide this to the employee, uh, employees working in these facilities, and then they can spread that information uh, to the patients. Um, so what we're really seeing now is just uh, a great maturation of the regulatory process for medical cannabis. It's really an exciting time to be in this field. Uh, you know, uh, I think um, you know, Jim's introductory mar remarks for the conference uh, really framed it really well. You know, we could have no regulation or over-regulation or effective regulation. And what we're seeing is more effective regulation. And um, I think the other panelists are going to be speaking about some of these effective regulations, both with you know, product safety and training. Uh, labor standards is another important uh, aspect because we want to make sure the people who are working in this industry 
are treated with respect and paid uh, appropriately. So we're really seeing, it's an exciting time. We're, we're becoming a very uh, you know, uh, mature uh, industry and um, uh, I believe these other uh, experts up here will fill you in on some of the specifics of uh, some of this uh, expertise we're sharing. Thanks a lot for that introduction uh, for, to walk us through the, uh, the landscape. My name is uh, Philippe Lucas. I'm a graduate researcher with the Center for Addictions Research of British Columbia. I'm vice president of patient research and services for Tilray, a, uh, a medical cannabis producer in uh, Nanaimo, BC. And I'm also one of about 40,000 Canadians that currently uh, have federal authorization to use cannabis for medical purposes. Uh, today I'm going to walk you through the uh, landscape of medical marijuana in Canada. This has been a a really exciting year in Canada, um, probably the most eventful one since the implementation of the old program in 2001. But first I thought I'd give you a bit of background on medical cannabis in, uh, in Canada. Um, like uh, the U.S., medical marijuana at the federal level in Canada did not come about because of some uh, uh, open-hearted approach by the government. Um, it was done because patients fought for the right to access medical marijuana. Two patients, uh, Terry Parker and Jim Wakeford, uh, in 1999 and 2000, sued the government um, for the right to access medical marijuana. They were able to obtain constitutional, the constitutional right to use medical cannabis, and uh, ultimately that led to the implementation of Health Canada's medical marijuana access regulations in 2001. Um, although there's only about 40,000 uh, patients registered in the federal program right now, government research suggests that there's about 500,000 to a million Canadians that claim to have used cannabis for medical purposes, so that ends up being about 2 to 4 percent of the adult population. And even Health Canada's own estimates of the growth of this program over the next 10 years suggest that we'll have about 450,000 patients um, by 2024. I actually think it's going to be greater than that as the program evolves. Um, so the MMAR has been plagued with problems since its inception. Um, there have been uh, at least 10 occasions where it's been found unconstitutional and therefore illegal for not providing safe access to medical marijuana for patients, um, for either restricting access, taking too long to process forms, etc. And um, some of the ongoing issues include resistance from the medical community at the provincial and federal level. A lot of doctors don't want to be seen as pot docs. They feel uncomfortable because of liability reasons for prescribing medical marijuana. Um, there's a 33-page application as part of the old Health Canada program that you then would have to send out to Health Canada. It would take six weeks to six months to process. So if you're a terminal patient and wanted to, uh, uh, wanted to gain access, this program was virtually uh, unusable for you. Um, there was a really low acceptability and a lack of strain selection in the federal supply. For 10 years, one producer, Prairie Plant System, was able to supply one strain of cannabis to all Canadian patients. It was the only legal supply. If that strain didn't work for you, or if, heaven forbid, you might want cannabis that wasn't gamma irradiated, then that was simply not going to uh, be available to you. And it, that was shown by the patient uptake, which is about only about 10% of the federal patients uh, actually bought the federal supply despite it being subsidized and priced at $5 a gram, uh, just to show you how poor that, that product was. There is um, cost is an ongoing barrier to safe access. Um, there's no current provincial uh, coverage. In Canada, we have uh, socialized health insurance, and so we do have uh, provincial coverage for a lot of prescription medications, but cannabis doesn't fall under that, uh, that guise, unfortunately. And um, dispensaries, which uh, there are about 75 or 80 of them in Canada, are very popular with patients. They're actually one of the number one sources of access, but they've never been legal or regulated in Canada, and that continues to be the case. So the new MMPR, um, which the government spent three years doing consultations with patients, police, uh, municipal groups to be able to build towards, is definitely a step in the right direction. Um, as I mentioned, it's the most significant step and forward in this program uh, since 2012, and one of the only that's, or since 2001, and it's one of the only ones that have been, that's been promoted by the government rather than being forced through by the courts. That's the only way we've been able to make progress in this program in the past was by suing the government. Um, the, the pros of this program are a simplified uh, decentralized application process. 
that 33-page application is replaced now by a single page. Your doctor recommends it. Uh, in his office, you walk out being a legal medical marijuana patient, so no wait times, et cetera, which is amazing. Uh, Theoretically, nurse practitioners can prescribe. I say theoretically because the, no, no uh, provincial organizations representing nurse practitioners has applied for that right, but Health Canada opens that up. And so where, whereas physicians continue to be resistant, we might be able to see some nurse practitioners fill in some of the gaps, at least we hope. Um, multiple licensed producers, I'll talk about this a little bit more further on. Now, instead of having the one monopoly producer, Health Canada has opened it up to multiple producers. This isn't happening anywhere else in the world right now, and it's a very exciting time. Um, we've got increased quality control that comes with those licensed producers because it is heavily regulated and increased strain symptom awareness as well as associated research. On the con side, a patient like myself used to be allowed to produce my own cannabis and Health Canada wanted to take that right away and replace it uh, instead by these large scale licensed producers. I'm someone who, despite working for a licensed producer, believes that anything that increases options for patients is a benefit. And, uh, and so the loss of the right to produce your own, I think, uh, for particularly from fixed income patients, has been really problematic. Um, the health community, the uh, physicians are still resistant to prescribing. That's another issue. Dispensaries are not included in the new regulations, which I think is a real missed opportunity. In fact, licensed producers will be shipping it via courier to patients, which may seem convenient in some ways, but without that face-to-face -face interaction, I think something's still missing in patient care. And uh, still no cost coverage, and only raw cannabis is allowed to be uh, produced by these licensed producers, rather than alternative uh, methods of ingestion. So um, the loss of personal production was, uh, was the, probably the most controversial part of this, uh, this change uh, by Health Canada. It really satisfies the needs of municipalities and law enforcement and put them as the primary stakeholders in the changes rather than putting patients who are actually the reason this program exists as the stakeholders. Um, the, it's problematic for some patients. If you're on low income or fixed income because of disability and you've been producing your own cannabis, uh, the government wanted to take away that right and inevitably that was going to lead to a cost increase. And anyone who's researched medical cannabis access knows that one of the main obstacles to access is cost. Um, the, I think that we could have found a real middle ground by simply mandating that there be electrical inspections to those, uh, to those producing their own cannabis at home. Uh, I think that that would have addressed the concerns of municipalities and police of home production. Um, now there has been something interesting that's gone on. Patients have started constitutional and, and, and court challenges against Health Canada's new changes and they've in fact managed to win an injunction last month that freezes the old production licenses. So um, instead of losing the right to produce their own cannabis, now patients can also produce their own cannabis and we have licensed producers as well, so it's kind of the best of both worlds. That's indefinite right now until that court case is, whole, uh, is uh, heard, but it's a good state of affairs for the moment. So the end of monopoly on supply, I think, is the best uh, step forward that this program has taken. There are over 600 applicants right now to get a license to produce cannabis on a large scale in Canada. Um, and um, so they're, they're, uh, Health Canada is struggling to process all of those. There's stringent, re stringent regu regulations. In fact, they've developed a whole new set of regulations called the, uh, the Good Production Practices or GPP regulations to govern the production of cannabis. It allows producers like Tilray, who I work for, to adopt recognized uh, regulations and we've chosen to follow the American uh, Pharmacopeia regulations in terms of the standards that we set for the production of our cannabis and ultimately we'll be seeking GMP uh, uh, compliance as well. Um, there's no plant limits, which is quite different than a lot of the state programs. If you want to produce a million plants under your Health Canada authorization, you can do so, but you've got to have a safe and less level of security based on the storage you, of cannabis that you want to uh, have in place uh, to, to match that amount of plants. And um, it's kind of interesting because of the international interest in this, because it is a unique system anywhere in the world. So we see Bedrocan, the Dutch producer, now has a Canadian arm that's uh, gotten a license to import the Dutch cannabis and sell it to Canadian patients. And we see some Israeli producers that are also uh, tied themselves to Canadian companies to be able to make their supply available to patients. Um, the, the facility, I wanted to, I, I can't speak for all the licensed producers, but I did want to show you guys what at least one licensed producer looks like in Canada. So I said, I, I work in Tilray, and it's no, uh, for Tilray, and it's located in Nanaimo, BC. Um, Nanaimo, as you can see, is just north of uh, Seattle and within a stone's throw of Portland and Vancouver. And uh, our facility is right there. 
And that's what a medical, you know, that's, other than having a big pot leaf spray painted on the roof, I think that's what a medical cannabis production facility looks like. It's not only unobtrusive, but we were courted by the government in Nanaimo, the local region, because they saw this as a job creator. They, we held a job fair where we had over 400 resumes submitted for 40 jobs. We interviewed 250 people over a weekend. It was promoted heavily by the local government as an economic development project and also as the dawning of a new biotech industry. So that's the way that municipalities can start looking at medical marijuana in North America. Um, that's Tilray itself, uh, and uh, it's been a, a really great experience so far. We've, uh, we just broke ground on this facility about four months ago, and already it's, in, uh, uh, it's uh, as you can see, really going well. We've got uh, 33,000 square feet in the warehouse, but we're going to have over 50,000 square feet of production because we've put in uh, two stories of production. The main uh, uh, requirements, the main challenging requirements, have been really in putting in the security infrastructure that's needed to be in place. Uh, our consultants tell us, and, and our security consultants have put in security at airports, police stations, and, uh, and prisons. They've never seen this level of security anywhere in the world. This is, uh, we're treating of this, of course, like it's plutonium, which of course it is. And, uh, and it's been quite wild uh, uh, to be part of this uh, facility, but you do feel safe when you're, you're in there, so that's the good news. Um, We've got uh, really cutting edge technology to produce the cannabis. The whole goal is to produce the absolute best supply of cannabis in Canada and therefore the world. And if you're gonna start uh, uh, doing that, you better start in British Columbia, or at least it's a good place to start. Um, the, uh, we've got dozens of strains already that are, uh, and you can go to uh, www.tilray.ca if you wanna see our strain selection at the moment that we're gonna be launching with within the next week or so. We have what's called a conditional license right now that allows us to produce cannabis and we expect our distribution license to be in place within about a week or so. And um, this really is the evolution of medical cannabis in Canada. Um, this is about patients knowing what they're getting about having a, a sense of security around the quality and the safety of their supply, and, uh, and yet still making the strains that are available to patients uh, and that patients find useful already. It's, uh, it's been a really exciting project. We've now received over 1,000 resumes for people who want to work at this facility, so it's something that's drawing a lot of attention nationally and otherwise. And I know that there's a lot of people who worry about you know, big cannabis coming in and taking over this industry. What I can tell you, and I've been involved in medical cannabis as a patient since 1995. I ran a nonprofit dispensary for 10 years called the Vancouver Island Compassion Society. In all of my years as a medical cannabis patient and advocate, I've never seen so much money and so many resources devoted to try and meet patient needs. And so uh, certainly for better or for worse, I think that these large scale licensed producers are creating a really patient centered approach to medical marijuana. And I think that the current MMPR is really just a starting point. I think that uh, with um, the regulation of this industry, we're going to see some significant research opportunities, and we're already looking at doing clinical trials at Tilray. Um, my PhD research looks specifically at, at medical cannabis patients' patterns of use with a focus on cannabis substitution effect. We've got, uh, we're going to be pushing for other methods of ingestion. Right now, we're only allowed to ship out raw cannabis, but I suspect that because of resistance from the medical community, it be, won't be long before that changes in the regulations. There's no storefronts currently allowed, but I think we can all uh, understand why it's more intuitive to be distributing this kind of medicine and providing the necessary information for safe use on a face-to-face -face basis. So I expect that to change in the next few years. And eventually, um, one of my goals is to get provincial cost coverage so that cost is never an obstacle to access in Canada. And ultimately, um, we're, we're clearly focused on the idea that Regulating this industry, regulating production, is one more step towards, uh, uh, towards uh, legal legalization. And so I just can't wait to see what this industry brings. Um, I really want to close by thanking uh, Americans for Safe Access for putting on this amazing conference. Uh, CARBC, the Center for Addictions Research in British Columbia, for supporting my research and the University of Victoria, as well as, well as my employer Tilray and all of you. And I understand that we don't have a lot of time for questions today and maybe no time, but I'm going to be here all weekend. I'm happy to speak with you about anything that we're doing or anything that's going on in Canada. Thank you very much. Hello, 
everyone. Welcome. Um, my name is Kristen Navidal. I am, thank you, <laughs> California folks in the front here. Um, I am with the Emerald Growers Association. I'm the founding chair. I also work with ASA on their patient focus program, and I am on the board of directors for the Coalition for Cannabis Policy Reform. Um, I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about cannabis farming in the United States. Um, I like to call it farming because I really think it's important that we get back to realizing that this botanical medicine is a product produced for human consumption. And with that, it should be treated like an agricultural crop. Um, currently, that's not really what tends to be happening here. Um, we have two basic models that are being utilized in the United States, um, and it's dependent upon states. Um, some states like to use a plant count based model that says a cultivator may produce X amount of plants for a specified number of patients. And this does have some downsides, right? It um, limits the cultivator's opportunity or ability to properly use their space and consumes more resources than if we were to look at a square footage model. Um, it moves us away from an agricultural model. And as these plants are grown as large as they can possibly reach during a life cycle, those life cycle t or those times of the life cycle are increased, and these very large plants become harder to manage, have more um, risk of disease and pest issues than when we work towards an agricultural model. Um, this is an example of an outdoor plant here. I mean, you can see this gentleman probably, the sheriff is reaching up probably close to seven feet tall. This plant is probably maxing out 10, 12 feet. Um, 100 square feet of smaller plants is going to yield roughly the same amount as this 100 foot, you know, square foot plant. And this is much more prone to, again, disease, um, pest issues, and is excessive consumption of resources. Um, this model also happens indoors, right? Here's an example. We have states that um, allow for licenses, um, cultivation licenses, and use um, not less lighting because there's fewer plants, in a lot of cases more lighting, and it's a subpar product. Um, it it's reduces safety for patients and consumers. Um, so a square footage model. Let's talk about that, right? All agricultural crops produced for human consumption are based on a square footage model, even fruit trees. You don't go to the Department of Agriculture and say, I want to grow 20 fruit trees. You declare the acreage of peaches or apples you have. Um, and, you know, when we look at the square footage model, cultivators can shorten the lifespan of these plants, right? They can reduce the vegetative times. They produce more smaller plants. The yields are still excellent, but that shorter time frame of lifespan for the plant produces a much healthier, easier to manage, and uh, disease and pest resistant product. Um, this is an example of a square footage model seeing open field produced. And this picture is from Spain. Um, and you, I don't know if you can see, but there's some wooden hoops here. Um, a couple reasons for putting those up would be to try to do some light deprivation. It looks like there's some plastic laying on the ground in between rows. Um, these plants are covered to use the natural daylight to veg the plants and then close them early to force them into flower early so that we have lots of small plants finishing at the same time. Um, this also increases the ability to do longer strain varieties um, outdoors because the longer flowering cycle can be forced without relying on the weather and the sun's natural light cycle. Um, again, this model is used indoors. Um, Colorado has a square footage based model. Um, so do some other states. And it really um, is to the benefit of the producer um, as far as producing a really high quality, safe crop. Um, but also we see advantages to the regulator, right? One of the things that we see in the US or we hear objections to with cannabis cultivation are the risks of diversion. And when an applicant comes to a regulator and says, I'm gonna grow 99 plants, for example, we have, as a regulator, no idea what the production um, output is gonna be of that crop, right? When we look at a square footage based model, you can roughly estimate in a much more accurately, accurate way what the production of a square footage garden is going to be. So a square footage model also has um, more ability to allow for an audit of checks and balances, um, uh, 
and prevent diversion activities. Um, but, you know, what we're seeing in the U.S. is this strong tendency towards indoor cultivation. And a lot of this has to do with security and kind of the, you know, out of sight, out of mind. If I don't see it and I don't smell it, I don't have to worry about it. And it's a little easier to move into mainstream um, and reach approval for. But what we have here is a um, chart that was produced by Dr. Evan Mills in 2011. He did this um, carbon footprint study in California called Energy Up in Smoke. And we're going to talk a little bit about that as we look at some of the environmental issues associated with cultivation across the board. Um, indoor cultivation really uses a lot of high intensity lamps. I mean, lighting is one of their, the major energy consumption pieces for indoor cultivation. But we also have air conditioners, heating, water pumps, climate control, dehumidifiers, um, transportation to get the product to and from the cultivation site to patient access centers, um, and even getting um, supplies into the cultivation site. Um, if we were to kind of break it down as to what's used, we would see that around 76% of the energy consumed during indoor cultivation is the result of lighting, ventilation, dehumidifiers, and air conditioning, right? So what does this mean? So back in 2011, when Dr. Evan Mills did this study, it was really before we had as many states as we have right now producing cultivation indoors. And at that point, he estimated the cost of cannabis production and its distribution to be at $5 billion in the US. That's, that's pretty significant. Um, and the resulting emissions of that were about 17 million tons of CO2 per year. Um, this really is not um, long-term sustainable, right? We, it's about driving three million cars every year. Um, and so what that breaks down to is if you look at a kilogram of cannabis, which is just over two pounds of cannabis, you could do like 4.9 cross-country trips in your eco-friendly 44-mile-per-gallon car, which none of us probably have. Or <laughs> put 2.8 tons of CO2 into our environment, and that cannabis joint that some of us may have medicated with this morning, um, if produced indoors, resulted in about two pounds of CO2 gases in our environment. Um, you know, we're going to have to make some changes. Um, part of the way to do that is to move back towards farming, right? Looking at greenhouse techniques, row covers, um, and granted greenhouses may or may not use artificial light to make for multiple crop cycles within the, the um, year's time, but this is supplemental light, right? And we'll look at some of these. Um, and they may require ventilation, heating, and cooling, but we're not talking every day and year round, and this is going to also be climate specific. Um, and one of the things that we're coming into a hard time with in the U.S. is that because of the out of sight, out of mind favoring of cannabis production or um, discomfort around it, um, greenhouses and row covers are only allowed in some states right now, so we have some work to do. And to even further reduce um, our carbon footprint and our environmental impacts, moving towards open air production is really where we're going to need to go. Farming, 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 all the way. And, you know, what this means is we see consumption, use of medical marijuana, and the increase in um, legalization in, in the United States. We've also seen the increased consumption or use of concentrates, which, you know, we're not going to be able to use these high energy consumptive um, means of cultivation for those crops. So we're going to have to really diversify into more open field, open air production. Um, this here is an example of a pretty high-tech greenhouse. It's suitable for year-round production. Notice that the lamp spacing compared to the earlier pictures is, you know, instead of being every four to five feet here, ranges about every 10 feet. And then again, remember, it's supplemental lighting. It's only being used when necessary, when to extend those daylight hours, when we drop down below 12 hours of daylight, um, et cetera. These plants are small. Um, and they're finishing. So this is a, looks like a healthy crop to me. This is what we tend to see in California, Emerald Triangle. Um, 
This is an outdoor garden here, really based on square footage. This picture was taken probably in July. If you notice, the hoops on both sides of the main greenhouse have depth plastic on the ground there. These hoops are about six or seven feet wide. They range 100 feet long. This crop will finish, another one will be planted, and it will finish out in the natural daylight of the sun. This greenhouse here is completely solar. Let's see if my laser pointer works. I got a solar panel here, running these fans here, and a solar panel here. All of these pots here are late plants. They weren't put in until July, maybe late June. They'll finish naturally with the sun and result in one crop here. Um, this is another example of the same thing. You know, what we're seeing in the press with outdoor cultivation is that the sheriff and local authorities are like, oh my god, these are huge, horrible environmental um, cultivation scenes. And these actually are very tidy. And the previous picture here, um, this is completely off of groundwater. Every single bit of the water used in this scene here um, is coming from a pond that fills with rainwater only. Um, this is a similar situation here. And this, again, is where we're headed. Um, so let's talk about what's happening in the press, right? I'm sure most of you are familiar with the egregious environmental claims coming out of cultivation, outdoor cultivation is getting slammed, but let's put it into perspective. Um, trespass grows accounted for about 72% of all outdoor plants seized in California in 2013. These scenes here, not a trespass grow. This is at someone's homestead. This is a farm, a farm, a farm, a farm. Trespass grow, right? So here we are in the public lands. Notice tall trees, and in the spaces in between, all of this green down in here are, is marijuana, cannabis planting happening. Notice trees on the ground. Boom, 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 boom. This is where we need to change the conversation about what's happening in the media. This is not our medical providers, okay? This is what they leave behind, right? Law enforcement has a tendency to come in and eradicate, and that scene I showed you in the last slide ranged about a mile and a half wide and three miles down the hillside. It was spread out into multiple sections of Trespass Grow, um, located in eastern Humboldt County. It is to today the only cleanup effort that has happened in any of these trespass grows in Humboldt County because there simply is not the funding for the reclamation activities, even if they get eradicated, and Forest Service complained for two years before they got federal funding to eradicate that scene. This is what we found when we got there. We found this. This is uh, Murad Gabriel. Some of you may be familiar with some of the work he's done. He's been studying the fishers and their decline in habitat. He's a Department of Fish and Wildlife biologist. He's removing a toxic pesticide product that was imported from Mexico. Um, and here we have a close-up of the trees fall. Um, this is from a different garden site. They don't let us come in and clean up garden sites unless everything's been eradicated. So. Um, this is kind of a mixture of slides here. This is one of the seven water diversions that was happening on that garden site. Um, we pulled those out by hand. But the thing to know here about this and many of these sites is that they have been there for years. Many of these are not newly created, they're being reused, and unless we can make for regulation that provides funding for the reclamation of these activities, these go on year after year after year. The fact that we cleaned up this one site in Humboldt County means that the neighbors probably won't be dealing with cultivators coming back in there. That's not the case very often that these sites get cleaned up. So why are we experiencing the high volume of trespass grows um, across the nation on our public lands? Well, it's a valuable unregulated crop right, with a strong black market because patients don't have access. In many places they don't. Even in California, access has been mm, stifled or hit and miss. It, it, it works and then it doesn't work and we're subject to federal preemption because we don't have a statewide regulatory system and public land is cheap, right? The individuals growing there are not paying a mortgage on it. They aren't subject to um, forfeiture issues. And so why not? And their odds are really good, right? It took two years after discovery of that site to get someone out there to eradicate it. So, and then if they eradicate it, you can just go back and plant next year because usually they don't get cleaned up. Oh, skipped one. 
Um, private lands, we are seeing some um, issues on private lands, although they are a very small per percentage of the environmental issues happening out there. Um, and they include stuff like this from Mother Jones. You guys may have seen some of these pictures. Um, this is some illegal grading activity happening here. These trees were cut down, um, pushed around, and now we have greenhouses. And I imagine that over the course of the next few years, if not already, um, the plans are to expand these gardens here. Um, and on the ground, it tends to look more like this. These fish and wildlife water boards are moving forward in California with trying to remedy some of these issues. This is um, a logging flat on your right. This debris here is actually burying um, a stream bed. So that was, this is a fish and wildlife um, slide. Um, this is another fish and wildlife slide. Both of these were taken on places that were raided and um, forced into mitigation. This is a self-made pond in a headwater stream, right? So, um, you know, what we need is regulation so people feel safe going and getting grading permits, right? And they feel safe going to the Department of Fish and Wildlife and getting their 1,600 water permits and the other needs. Um, and a lot of this is happening because of that fear, but also of the lack of education, both on the parts of regulatory agencies and cultivators um, who are producing. Um, additionally, we have some kind of backwards policies that have happened for many years with local municipalities and state agencies where lots of 1,600 water permits or water draws have not been the agencies haven't moved forward with providing the education or enforcing grading permits, the need for water draw permits, um, everything from a, sp a spring on your land to a pump in the creek requires a permit and most people, even if they're just flushing their toilet with water they're taking from their property require a permit and probably 98% of the folks don't have them, whether they're cultivating or not. Um, Again, solutions. I mean, that's what it's all about, right? Moving back towards an agricultural model. Um, this is, I can't emphasize enough, a crop that's produced for human consumption, patient and consumer safety starts on the farm. Um, and let's let the Department of Agriculture do their job, right? They regulate pesticides, they understand how to work with farmers towards best management practices, and they often have educational programs that should be part of any regulatory system. Uh, descheduling or rescheduling of cannabis would actually allow the Environmental Protection Agency to move forward with establishing tolerance thresholds, which would create a much safer pesticide um, use guidelines in the U.S. where we have no um, pesticide tolerances for cannabis. Um, and let's look at refocusing law enforcement to these trespass grows and funding them for reclamation activities. Let's get these forests cleaned up um, and reduce our carbon footprint by continuing to encourage greenhouse and open air field production. Um, this is grapes. Right, and the reason why I put this picture up here is because, you know, in California, grapes are number two, probably in cash crop to cannabis. This is um, in Sonoma County. It's on a hillside. This is kind of the top of the hill. This is the drainage of the bowl here. Um, we can see that a lot of the same activities that we're having environmental issues with are happening in other agricultural products, but this is a heavily regulated um, agricultural product here. Um, land was moved to create these terraces. These are very steep terraces here. And we have pond, 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 all man-made, all with heavy equipment. The beauty about this, this is regulated, it's organic, it's biodynamic, it's certified sustainable, and it is one of the premier wines coming out of Sonoma County right now. These farmers have been here for 30 plus years, raised their family here, and this, my friends, I believe is where we are headed. And away from this, and more of this, and more of this, and less of that. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. All right, we're all awake here. Uh, my name is Marina Foss Hoopert. Um, 
I'm the legislative and political director for Local 881 of the United Food and Commercial Workers. I want to first thank um, Americans for Safe Access and staff for, allow for inviting me to come and speak with all of you. We like to take all of these opportunities very seriously to speak with uh, potential partners in this industry because it is just so important that we start a, a good dialogue and that uh, when you see one of us from the United Food and Commercial Workers, you see us as, uh, as somebody that you can, you can approach, that you, we can talk to, that we have a lot in common. The reason I'm here today is um, I don't have any cool slides to show you, so you'll just have, to, you'll just have me to look at, but <clears throat> uh, we represent people who work in uh, food and retail. Uh, we are your pharmacy techs. We are the people who check you out when you go buy groceries, uh, your cashiers, the people that are stacking food, the people that are cutting your meat. and uh, We are those people, the people that you interact with on an everyday basis. And uh, it just so happens that the cannabis industry is a perfect fold uh, into what our, our folks do. And we represent people who, who service patients, who, uh, who service the public, and um, we adhere to a great deal of regulation, as you might imagine. You know, this, these are products for, for human consumption. And we want to make sure that we do a good job for our, for our customers, that the business remains profitable, and that we hold the industry accountable, and that we work with community partners to ensure that. And so that's, that's why I'm here. Um, so just to give you just an example, in the, we represent pharmacy techs at, uh, at, uh, at CVS out in, uh, where I live in Illinois, and our collective bargaining agreement um, has you know, anywhere from you know, wages to health care benefits, procedures. Uh, pharmacy techs have to undergo training under Illinois regulation. Um, it's, in, it's in statute as part of the uh, uh, what all pharmacies have to do to be able to operate a pharmacy. And it is our job, is not only as a, a person that represents, um, an organization that represents the interests of, of those employees, but we also do our part to ensure that, they're, that the employee is, is being professional and doing their job and getting there on time and is handling whatever is being provided to the patient with the utmost care. And that is really where the partnership and the beauty of all this makes sense is that uh, we are that, that party that is going to help everyone be held accountable. And if, uh, if the operator is, you know, not uh, adhering to the law or adhering to, adhering to regulation, if there's any wage theft, if there's not proper training going on, um, we have to obviously represent the interest of the worker. Um, but we could also take it a step further. You know, we can get the regulators involved. We can get inspections to happen. We can speak with elected officials. We can partner with patients in the area to, uh, to ensure that, that we can address the problem and be able to correct it uh, right away uh, because we don't want to put anybody, uh, anybody at risk for anything that they consume. And so we're already doing this work. Uh, on behalf of patients and on behalf of communities where we where, where, that we serve, um, and so in our in in the in the pharmaceutical industry in, in Illinois, um, it's it's there. It's a, you know this is a professional practice uh, affecting the public health and safety and welfare, and is subject to regulation and control in the public interest. And uh, you know so, like this industry. It should receive the confidence of the public and that qualified persons who are permitted to practice, you know, this type of, uh, in this type of industry have the appropriate training and safety measures to do so because, you know, the, the public trust is there. And so you have to have professional, oh, I'm sorry, okay, professional uh, conduct, discipline, and qualifications to, to do that. Um, the pharmacy techs are in charge of packaging, labeling, storage, you know, all of the things that would normally be, and all the, the, all the fundamental tasks that would normally also be applicable to the cannabis industry. Another example I want to talk about really quickly is, um, is you know, this is not, this, this is not from, from our industry, but in the, construction, in the construction industry. Our state has a policy where if uh, there's going to be a, uh, there's a construction project that goes out to bid, it's, it's a state-funded project, 
um, it has to uh, go through a series of review where, um, where a project labor agreement would adhere to like a, a certain, you know, a certain budget, a certain timeline, and there's uh, a wage structure, a prevailing rate that is applicable to that particular project. And so, you know, this isn't, definitely isn't the first time that labor has been involved in this conversation. Uh, because now is, you know, we see the, the, the cannabis industry taking a role in becoming part of our everyday lives. Uh, if there's one message that I wanted to get across to you today is that organized labor is definitely a partner um, in this industry and, and couldn't be a stronger partner uh, because we're there to, be sh to ensure that patients' needs are met. Um, <clears throat> so finally, one of the things that we had talked about um, with respect to how does labor fit into the, um, the cannabis industry from a regulatory standpoint. Um, Illinois, a state like Illinois is, um, is just, you know, we're, we're, we're developing rules and uh, I guess they're, they're, uh, the regulatory agencies have conducted public comment. <laughs> and so they're, they're just in the process of, you know, putting a lot of things in place. And so one of the things that we have uh, continuously advocated for to, you know, all the legislators and all the regulatory agencies is that um, the operators who are uh, going to be doing business here should definitely have some kind of standard for, you know, the proper training, the proper um, uh, education, that, you know, there should be some sort of, um, you know, uh, you know, we don't like to definitely don't like to dictate what people should should get paid everywhere, but certainly that there should be some recognition that these are professionals, and they're in the in industry where they're going to be serving patients and doing very intricate work, and that has to be recognized and brought to the forefront, and so uh, that really resonates, I think, with. Uh, with, with elected officials, and that's what we try to, to advocate. And so um, the proposed regulations do have some mention of those um, qualifications um, as, you know, as, as it moves on in the process. And, and we were happy to, to actually see that, that operators will be encouraged to, to making sure that their workplace has an, uh, uh, opportunities for employees. So we um, just want to continue to, to work on that and improve it and hopefully uh, be partners with, you know, continue a dialogue with uh, patient groups and other advocates who want to make sure that the cannabis industry becomes a successful one in, in Illinois and anywhere in the country for that matter. Um, so I just want to thank you for your time and, um, you know, if you have any questions, I'll be hanging around. I'm the person in the bright yellow here because that's usually our color. And uh, so I look forward to hearing from all of you. Thank you. <laughs> Amanda's working hard up here. <laughs> um, hi, everybody. I am uh, Jill Lamoureux, for those of you who don't know me. Um, I've kind of done a little bit of everything in cannabis from scrubbing pots to advising Washington State on recreational um, laws, but I have to tell you the patient focus certification program is something I am most proud of. Um, it has been a long haul. It brought together so many various people and um, groups, and it is um, I'm really proud of where we are. Last year I was up here kind of like giving an outline like we're kind of doing this and we might be doing that. So to see this final program now and to have the first centers and operators have gone through is really um, amazing actually. And so kind of the first, um, the purpose of patients first, um, oh I have to do this huh? Really simply, the purpose of the patient focus certification program is to let patients, physicians, caregivers, and other providers know where to go to get quality, consistent, safe, and patient focused products. It's really kind of that simple. That was why this was born. Um, however, there's more than just three purposes. 
um, it's multifold, and it is to bring um, operation and product standards into the medical cannabis industry. So now we have regulations going up everywhere in the states. Um, I'm from Colorado. Our very first version of the law had zero public safety, testing, any kind of standards at all, nothing. We lobbied and advocated and said, we want testing mandated, and the regulators looked at us and said, from who? And what are the standards? And we've got these guys driving around in mobile labs telling us this should be what the standard is. And none of our state, you know, none of our ISO labs or state labs will touch this product. So we are not comfortable doing this and therefore, eh, buyer beware, caveat emptor. Um, we also need to educate medical cannabis providers um, in the area of law, regulation, and best practice. Those dispensaries and operators are a patient's first contact. And if someone is not knowledgeable behind the counter or giving bad advice, that is just not fair to the patient. It's really the only source of information a patient has. So we need educated, empowered staff who can talk to patients and guide them through what can be a really scary process. A lot of patients, this is their last resort. They've come to cannabis because they've tried everything else. And they have years and years of, of fear behind them saying, I'm not really comfortable doing this. And if you've got somebody behind the counter who's like, I don't know what the laws are and you should just maybe try this, that's not a very comforting um, transaction. And we want to make sure that anybody who's working in one of these regulated operations understands the laws or understands when they don't and says, that's great, I'm not comfortable telling you that, and maybe that's something we need to do something about. Providing regulators with attainable, I think you said effective, um, standards for medical cannabis business. It, it's one thing to say that we have regulations, it's another thing if they're completely unenforceable or completely, if an operator can't comply at all. It, you know. Colorado, again, was one of uh, the first state to regulate dispensaries, and we treated it like plutonium. It was more about what law enforcement wanted than anybody else, and half of this we couldn't do. Not to mention the fact that, you know, we, people go out and say Colorado has the best regulations in the country. Well, nobody was enforcing them. And anybody from Colorado can tell you that, you know, a regulator hadn't stepped into a dispensary for years. It took years to actually make these regulations work. So as far as compliance, there was very, very, very little compliance in the first few years because people didn't even understand what the regulation meant. It was written poorly, it was disorganized, it made no sense. So, um, you know, patient focused certification is working with other partners to make sure that the regulations that they set mean something and they actually work and they have a purpose. Um, and then finally, informing healthcare providers, you talked about in Canada, uh, physicians still aren't comfortable with this. In Colorado, they did a study, 19% of family physicians, only 19% had ever recommended marijuana. That's a really low rate. I mean, it's probably higher than most places, but they have, physicians have fear, A, of their licensing, and B, because they don't really understand it as a medicine. They don't understand the plant, they don't understand the dosing, and they're just like, eh, why? I know that there's other physicians who will do that for you, so why don't you just go see them? Um, so it's about arming us patients with knowledge so we can educate physicians. Um, so how did this even all come about? Well, Steph and her infinite wisdom and progressive thought hounded uh, Mike McGuffin from the American Herbal Products Association for probably a year until he said, okay, I'll look at this. And, and she realized as a patient, more and more states were passing regulation legislation. We needed to organize, get some, as you said, educated help on how to protect, insulate, and move this forward the way we want to. And, and who does that? herbal products. What is this? A plant. What is it? It's an herbal remedy. So when people make the beer comparison, we're not beer. We are an herbal remedy. 
And so she found um, champions and created strategic partnerships and committed ASA funding to APA and American Herbal Pharmacopoeia. And it was really forward thinking and it took her a lot of convincing. If there's one thing Steph doesn't do, it's give up, ever. Yeah. And so she matched leaders in the cannabis industry with um, APA and with AHP and said, here, develop some standards, something that we can see. And every state's different in regulations. I work in every state. I guess say cannabis is probably the hardest because I don't like using the word marijuana, first of all, and with an H. I hate that. I hate it. Uh, I, it, drives, it drives me crazy, but you have to talk their talk. So, um, so we came together and spent years developing standards that the entire industry could agree on. I'll tell you, it wasn't easy. Kristen and I did rounds about, I'm an indoor grower. I mean, I'm from Colorado, we grow indoors. She's outdoor. To try to make both of those work for cultivation rules was interesting to say the least. And there were some marathon, marathon phone calls. Um, I think I even did some of them on a treadmill, actually, so. Um, but we came together and, and we took these standards and decided, you know, develop patient-focused certification on other certification programs like ISO and, um, and NSF and Good Housekeeping. And I can't say how invaluable Jane Wilson has been from APA because she came from NSF and came from a certification program and could give us guidance and say, yeah, you're on the right track. Um, and it's so important that ACE is doing this because it's an independent nonprofit. We are not talking about self-regulation of an industry. Although industry people did help build it, it is so much more credible with regulators to say, no, this is not self-regulation of the industry. This is not the beer industry promising we're not going to advertise to minors. These are experts who come together and done something attainable. And so our partners in this program um, American Herbal Products Association, again, Mike McCuffin, he told me I just couldn't take Steph's calls anymore, so I finally agreed. And he then internally, though, she had him convinced, he had to convince his entire organization that they should take on cannabis. APA is a, a over 30-year-old organization with huge respected lobbying power on the national level. Um, they have a board themselves. They have multiple boards. And he had to talk them into and saying, we, we need to approach cannabis. We need to look at this. This is in our wheelhouse. He had convincing to do. So this was a series of very long discussions and convincing people. Um, and he pushed it through and created the APA Cannabis Committee, which Tim Small is the um, uh, director of now, or committee chair. And they're still working. And it took two years to develop the first set of recommendations for regulators. And that was really because there were so many different industry folks involved, plus APA people, and coming to that workable solution where everybody could agree on a set. I'm sure not everybody's happy with everything. But to get to that point, Amanda chaired uh, for a while. I chaired. I think we went through four chairs. Um, that's how long this took. You, we, we just, I was like, I can't take any more conference calls. Someone else has to do this. Um, but we did it. And we're still doing it. And now APA is looking at extractions, which is so important. So we didn't stop. We started saying, let's look at dispensaries. We call it distribution, because it's distribution of the product. Um, cultivators, manufacturers, and laboratories. And now it's expanded extractions, because we see so much negative press um, about extractions. And extraction is not new. Um, any liquid you take that has any herb in it has been extracted, and they've been doing it for years. It is safe, it is effective, and it needs to be addressed by regulators and not just outright banned. Um, and then AHP, American Herbal Pharmacopoeia. So I always, when stuff asked me to come on and help develop this program, I got the APA piece, no problem. Got it. Standards for regulators. Plant monograph, I had never even really heard of, seen. I didn't get it. I didn't understand what it was. And the more I learned, I was like, oh, that's really cool. I can tell you that my husband and I fight over this. And he's a cultivator. This book is my new Bible. It is amazing the amount of information in here, and we have a lot of ASA board members who contributed, but if you 
please, Byron, and read it. And then you look at the names. I mean, so much expertise went into this. I had no idea how valuable it would be until I saw it. And I was just like, if I had had this four years ago when I started my dispensary, my recommendations to patients would have been so much more educated. I mean, it was such a crapshoot all the time. And we're taking that guessing game out. And this is what's going to help physicians get more comfortable. And APA's next step is dosing recommendations. And once we can point to a credible third party that says, here's dosing recommendations, physicians can start to let their guard down. So those are the three main groups who came together to put this together. So the, the last part of this is now, OK, we have standards, so now what? Well, let's go verify that people are actually following these standards. So PFC, Patient Focus Certification, is the only nonprofit third-party certification system for the industry. Um, it is APA and AHP are independent and credible organizations. Those are what the certification is built on. Are you following APA standards and are you following AHP standards? They are independent, they are credible, they are not the stepchildren. And so when you talk to a regular and say, I'm certified based on standards by these third parties, it carries a lot more weight than I do the best I can. Um, legislation and rulemaking efforts are happening all over the country every day. New states come online. Uh, we see things that we need to, to talk about and discuss and point to effective standards. CBD-only bills are not effective. We need whole plant medicine, no concentrates. There's none in Canada. There's other states that say no hat Washington um, for a while, and they finally turned the corner. But when you can bring in this and say, here's the standards you should develop or adopt for extractions, it makes them much more comfortable. Nevada adopted these. Illinois is adopting these. This is going to be our Bible going forward. Um, so if you can and you're an operator, get involved. You can join and get on the committees, and it's, it, this work's never going to end, I don't think. I think this committee will be standing for the next 30 years. Um, and it's overseen by a review board. So the certifications are done by auditors. Kristen's an auditor. I'm an auditor. And it's overseen by a review board that makes sure um, that the audits are independent. And so currently the audit process, um, it's a voluntary program. It, we are hoping that it becomes mandated in states. So when you're doing your lobbying, you should talk to your regulators and say, we want certified operators. So we see some certified training happening in DC and other states and ASA is a DC certified um, trainer. But these regulators, even when they get comfortable with the regulations, they're not comfortable with the industry. They don't know what they're looking at. They're using plant counts instead of square footage based regulation. They don't really know what they're doing. So, and they use third party certifiers all the time. Most likely the restaurant you ate in, if it was inspected at all, um, was probably inspected by a third party. And so ASA wants to move into that space and say, we know how to look at these operations and we'll teach you. Um, Illinois is interesting. We talk about agriculture getting involved. They are the first state where we are dealing with the Department of Ag, which has been great, but also somewhat difficult because they're very stuck in this no pesticide, no acceptable tolerances. But they've moved. Even before they've issued rulemaking, they've already gone from a no pesticide stance to OK, we'll accept these pesticides because they're looking at this book and they're talking to testing labs. And so educating the regulators is the most important thing that we can do. And so um, we've partnered with the Cannabis Training Institute to do the training for the staff to make sure that they're educated. They know what they're selling. They know how to talk to patients. Um, and then PFC auditors will come in and supplement with some live training. So that's been working really, really well. And um, from all reviews of people who've done the Training Institute programs, they love it. They think it's great. It's simple. They can do it on their time. They can go back and relook at something. I don't know if you've sat in an all-day training, and a lot of it leaves. So um, you can go back to the website and, and follow up. 
Uh, the auditors go in, so this, it seems boring, but I actually love doing this. Um, we review <laughs> documents, policies, procedures on site. We verify that they're compliant with the OPA and AHP standards. And then we do on site observation and say, okay, you've adopted policies, are people actually following them? I don't know how many work in traditional corporate um, environments, but usually that big fat SOP manual is just stuffed up there and maybe taken out every two years. Our industry, we need to follow our policies and procedures. We need to constantly evolve them. Um, we need to develop them and our staff needs to be, again, knowledgeable, leads to empowerment. So an educated, empowered staff who understands those policies backwards and forwards can help operators point out deficiencies and say this policy doesn't work and here's why. And then we do random follow-up visits to ensure the business is staying compliant with the standards. Um, one of the coolest features of PFC is this complaint resolution process where patients and caregivers, their caregivers and physicians have a place to go to uh, give adverse reaction reports and PFC will follow up on those. So instead of just writing a bad weed maps review and saying this place stinks, you actually have um, a source to go to and say, hey, I'm very concerned about the products being sold here and we will follow up on it. And so what's next for PFC? Because we have the first phase done, um, but it's not gonna stop. And as I had said, you know, Nevada and Illinois are already adopting these standards, Maryland, Florida, New York, we have states coming online every day. So when you're out there lobbying for this stuff, you also need to be lobbying for these standards and these regulations. Um, outreach to all the existing and new states, so we're gonna uh, shore up our outreach program. We're gonna provide audit and inspection, like I said, those third-party services for those states who need assistance. Yeah, I was talking about Illinois Ag. They're used to it. They're used to visiting farms. They don't need assistance there. But IDFPR, well, we have five regulatory agencies in Illinois. I think five. Yeah, fun. Um, there's one that says, yeah, we don't really know what we're doing. We'd be happy to look at IDFPR, who does the dispensaries, who regulates professionals like stockbrokers and they're like, yeah, we have no clue what we're doing. So they would benefit greatly from these third-party certifications. Um, outreach to providers, like I said, it's so much more important that we get more physicians involved in medical cannabis and feeling comfortable. So the dosing guidance that HP is working on will be, I think, invaluable to that. Um, we need to educate more physicians. That's our job as patients and their caregivers to not it's an uncomfortable conversation, but it's one that needs to be had. And when you're in a state that you have the right to do this, you have the right to demand your physician get educated. Um, and then we need to have patients asking for certified entities. Colorado passed legalization. We have this weird hodgepodge of recreational stores, medical stores, dual use stores. Just because uh, cannabis is legal, patients haven't gone away. And stores are making decisions on who they're gonna serve based on the tax rate, their local zoning, and it's not very easy to tell where patients can still get good quality care. So this allows patients to know where to go. Um, demand certification from your regulars. Say, hey, it's great you have regulation, but um, I want a little bit more than that. If you come from a regulated state, you know that regulations do not equal quality by any means. And so this allows patients to find quality product. And then educate your non-cannabis specialist physician, because now we call them cannabis specialists. So when I work in other states and they say, well, what about these doctor mills and da 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 and all these doctors are writing all these recommendations. It's because nobody else will. They're cannabis specialists. They are not mills. They focus on this, just like an oncologist focuses on cancer. This physician focuses on cannabis. I don't think anybody can say that Alan Shackelford, Harvard-trained MD in Colorado, is a mill. Um, so we need to educate other physicians and say, talk to one. Talk to a different physician and see where they're coming from and why they will do this. Um, and finally, since I know I'm the only thing between you and lunch, I just kind of want to thank everybody who's brought this together and ask you to get involved either as a patient or an operator. 
APA for you know getting out there first and taking the chance to work with stepchildren. Um, and American Herbal Pharmacopoeia, they bumped this up on their list before other monographs they wanted to publish because they saw it was so important. Canvas Training Institute, we could not, we had struggled with training and Greta Carter, who is leading the charge on this, has done an amazing job because I just looked at Steph and said, training, I have so much to do. So this is such a crucial piece. And then all of these operators here, including the labs, are the ones who are in the beta group. They were the first ones to step on board. Um, Len's here and um, Tim's here and they're, they're stepping up and saying we care about patients, we care about this project, so if you live there, frequent them and recommend them because they're the ones who are showing that they are the most concerned about patient safety and quality. So thank you guys.